Okay, thank you for coming today. Um, today we have a very interesting talk about how to combine research and companies. Okay, research and startups. Many of us probably have had the idea how can we make, how can we introduce our research in a company. Okay, today we will have this talk and we have the honor to have Professor Walter Scheider from the University of Notre Dame. And he will talk about this, how to combine research and company. Walter received his PhD in engineering at the University of Colorado, Colorado Springs. And he was a postdoctoral fellow at the Harvard University. Now he is assistant professor at the University of Notre Dame. And he's doing an outstanding research in computer vision, machine learning, and biometrics and digital humanities. Today, Walter would like to share with us his experience building two companies, two companies in computer vision. And let's welcome Walter. I don't know if you want to be interrupted by questions. Yeah, I think this is, I, no, it's fine. If you have questions, please feel free to interrupt me. This is a small enough group where I don't think that will be too distracting. Um, thank you, Domingo, for that wonderful introduction. Um, thank you for being here. Um, I'm really excited. This is my first trip to Chile. I'm really enjoying uh, this beautiful city. Um, it's been a great experience so far, talking to folks here at the university and just exploring uh, what the city has to offer. Um, so today I'm going to talk about, yeah, how do you combine research and entrepreneurship? Um, if you have a cool idea, um, if it's great in an academic context, is it going to be good in a commercial context? Maybe, maybe not. What does it take to start a company? I'm going to share some thoughts uh, based on my own experience doing this. Um, and I'm going to talk specifically about two companies that I've been involved with. Um, and I think you'll find this interesting. I hope you find this interesting. <laughs> um, first, though, a little bit about me. Um, I joined Notre Dame uh, about three years ago, a little over three years ago. Um, coming from Boston, um, uh, I did my PhD, um, as the intro mentioned, at the University of Colorado. And that's going to be really important for this talk, as it turns out. Um, because from there, I went on to um, work at a startup called Securix Incorporated, which was in the human biometric space. Very interesting set of technologies there. Um, and it was really the work we were doing at the university lab that formed this company. Um, really spawn some interesting uh, commercial research and then finally a product. So I'm going to walk you through all of that. Um, though I, th that it didn't sort of stop there. Um, uh, after we did Securix, I went on to um, uh, a postdoc at Harvard. Um, and while I was there, I was working on some really cool research and I'll share some of that with you today. Um, but then there was some, you know, sort of other thoughts about doing another company. And so I'm going to be talking about my current startup, uh, which is in the Boston area called Perceptive Automata in the second part of this talk, which I think will be rather interesting. Um, uh, a little bit more about what I work on. Uh, my research is primarily in computer vision and machine learning. I'm guessing some of you in the audience are interested in these topics too. That's why you're here. Um, my group at the university is very interested in reverse engineering biological vision. Um, this is not the easiest way to approach computer science uh, in any regard, um, but it's leading to some interesting insights, uh, some of which I'll share uh, within this talk. Um, the idea being the brain is still superior to any artificial processing system, um, especially for these tasks um, that involve uh, pattern recognition. And we'd like to do a better job at understanding how the brain works. And it doesn't necessarily have to be a human brain. Uh, we do work with rodents. Uh, we look at other animal model systems to try to understand how vision works in different species um, and build some of those insights into engineering solutions for practical problems. Um, this also uh, has us working on a number of different tools for neuroscience, uh, tools to help scientists understand images from microscopy, uh, for instance. Um, Though we do some more traditional computer vision work as well, uh, statistical methods for visual recognition, uh, a lot of my work um, involves um, open set recognition, you know, what happens if you don't have all of the classes in the training data, for instance. And that's something I'm going to be talking about in depth tomorrow in case you're coming to the tutorial. Uh, I'll say a lot about that topic then. Um, very interested in extreme value theory. Um, it's a 
branch of statistics that helps us do some of this modeling to tackle the open set problems. Um, and then besides all the serious stuff, my lab does have some fun as well. Um, we're very interested in, in applications. Um, that's why I like entrepreneurship, uh, but it's also why I like academia. Um, and so my lab has a wing that works on the digital humanities, uh, looking for problems within the humanities that could benefit from computation. Uh, so we work on computer vision tools to analyze old manuscripts, right, to do optical character recognition uh, for medievalists and classicists. Um, we also do some natural language processing work uh, along the lines of um, uh, more humanistic uh, uh, endeavors. Uh, we have a very large project that's looking for text reuse in poetry, uh, essentially training the computer to identify novel instances of illusion. Um, so, so we do all of that as well. Um, but today I'm just going to really talk about um, computer vision and um, how some interesting research that's come out of the lab has been commercialized uh, in the past and is continuing to be commercialized uh, by uh, myself and various colleagues. Um, so that's a little bit of background, um, but I'm going to talk a little bit more about my background as this goes along because I think um, companies, it's more than just doing research. It's, you know, in academia, especially right at the, at the graduate level and above, um, you're kind of, you know, in your office working on a problem, sometimes in isolation, not really interacting with people. Um, in business, there's more of a human element to it. Um, it's very much collaborative. Uh, in a sense, uh, you're not just working with other researchers, other programmers, software developers. Um, you really have to work with uh, folks in a number of different domains, um, like business, for instance, right? You have to sell your product eventually, um, trying to understand how that uh, product lifecycle works, um, how to commercialize something successfully, how to market something. Um, these are different skill sets. Um, and so there's definitely this human element I want to uh, talk about quite a bit in terms of how these companies formed, uh, how did we build the teams, uh, how did we seek funding? Uh, and how did we develop a product that we could bring to market? Um, so uh, just here's a snapshot of, of some company involvement. This isn't even everything. Um, uh, so I, I was part of uh, this company, as I mentioned, Securix Incorporated back in Colorado. Uh, there I was the director of research and development. Um, currently, I'm a founder of this company, Perceptive Automata, which is building safety systems for autonomous vehicles. And I'm gonna have a lot more to say about these two companies. Uh, but I'm also advising uh, a few other companies, including Yambu, uh, which is a very cool uh, startup in the Washington, D.C. area that's doing uh, biometrics for um, uh, payment uh, at, at point of sales uh, terminals, um, which incidentally was something we were working on at Securix. So I kind of have the knowledge to impart to them on that. Uh, and I'm also advising another company called Ibex Aegis, uh, which is using computer vision uh, to do remote sensing applications, um, which is uh, an emerging uh, uh, area for uh, more advanced AI. I think computer vision has always been in that domain, uh, but more sophisticated AI capabilities are starting to uh, trickle in there as well. Um, I, I just wanted to throw those names out there. I think these are going to be exciting companies in the future, but for today we're going to talk about Securix and Perceptive Automata. Um, so to start, Securix, um, what was this company? Let's do a little bit of a deeper dive here. I'm going to talk a bit about uh, how it was formed, uh, the kind of work we did. Um, and this talk in general will pivot back and forth between some business experience and then also some research. Um, so I'll say a little bit about what we uh, were working on in terms of um, uh, computer vision applications, uh, what kind of some projects were we working on, and how did those translate then into a product which we could sell. Um, and then uh, what were the, the kind of hiccups <laughs> uh, we encountered along the way? Uh, it's never smooth when you do a startup. Um, I think there's lots of excitement over startups these days, especially um, uh, in the Silicon Valley world. Um, and, and people have very romantic notions about forming a company and it being successful. Uh, but there's a lot of trouble one experiences uh, along the way. Uh, and I'm going to share some of those stories, especially with respect to Securex, because it was a bumpy road, even though the outcome was uh, ultimately good for, for everybody involved. Um, so what was this company? So um, I. When, when, I, when I started doing computer science, I was an undergraduate student um, at Lehigh University. Um, and um, I, I honestly was not that excited about computing before I started working in a research lab. Um, uh, so that was kind of a big change for me personally in terms of my, my professional trajectory. Uh, in fact, we were laughing uh, at lunch the other day. I, I admitted that I was really a social science major when I started college. I was not uh, really interested in computing at all professionally. 
Um, and I went on to continue studying international relations and did complete a degree. Uh, but then I ended up adding computer science because I started working in a research laboratory uh, my sophomore year, so, so my second year of college. Um, and this was the research lab of uh, Terry Bolt, uh, who's a pretty big figure within computer vision and who ultimately became my PhD advisor. Um, and so what was interesting about this laboratory, it wasn't just the cool research we were doing in computer vision and specifically at that time uh, in human biometrics. We were very interested um, in face recognition, especially um, what you would call back then unconstrained face recognition. Uh, so faces in the wild, not just um, uh, in data sets, uh, which was kind of amazing back in the early 2000s. Um, now it's not as exciting. Um, we can do this on our phones, for instance. Um, and we were also working on some technologies for fingerprint recognition, but that was kind of on the back burner. Um, and so I got very excited about um, th these different technologies, uh, but also I got excited from Terry uh, about entrepreneurship. Uh, Terry is well known in the computer vision community for being a big proponent of starting companies and trying to commercialize technology. Uh, computer vision has a reputation of being a fairly rigorous field of study. And, and again, I'm sure there's some computer vision people like Domingo in, in the audience here. Uh, we're kind of nodding their heads. Um, and uh, for a long time, there wasn't that much commercial activity in the space. Um, there were some companies that were doing computer vision work, trying to commercialize some things. They were mostly in the security and defense world, and that's kind of where Securix started out, incidentally. Um, but, but there wasn't the kind of activity that there is today. Um, I, I was just at CVPR a few weeks ago, and the expo floor was just filled with exciting new companies, big companies that are now doing computer vision. Uh, it was just incredible, the growth and the commercial uh, interest in computer vision. Um, but back in the early 2000s, that wasn't the case. So I was very intrigued that Terry uh, was trying to form companies and trying to get um, technologies he saw as being commercially valuable out of the lab uh, and into the hands of uh, consumers, uh, customers. Um, and so, uh, Terry, Terry had a company doing uh, video-based surveillance when I first started and I worked a little bit with them. Um, but it wasn't until uh, the lab moved to Colorado that we started thinking seriously about consumer-facing uh, applications for human biometrics. Um, the first company Terry did while at Lehigh was, was really uh, video surveillance from smart cameras you know, target detection and tracking, you know, intruder detection, not really related to identity per se, but we were very interested as we saw uh, the capabilities improve. Uh, computer vision was getting better and better. Uh, machine learning uh, was really gaining traction in the early 2000s, so it was the right time to jump in on that. Um, and so Securix was formed in about, it was 2004, 2005. Um, and, and the idea behind this company was maybe there are really good things you can do with biometrics beyond security and surveillance um, that would enable some interesting applications. Uh, for instance, mobile payment. Um, and now, again, this, this seems like it's old hat, right? Um, uh, phones will let you pay for things with your fingers, right, or your face. Um, uh, fingerprint technology has become more pervasive and more acceptable to consumers. But back in the early 2000s, this was kind of a radical idea. Um, but other people had it as well. Again, it's not a particularly uh, um, uh, novel idea, I guess, in terms of the, the technology. But there were some problems with it, specifically related to security. Um, what if somebody stole your fingerprints? How could you recover? Um, it's very easy if somebody steals your, your password or your PIN right attached to your bank card or even your bank account to regenerate those numbers because they're really just numbers. Uh, but you can't really do that with your fingerprints or your face or your irises. Um, and so the, the company really formed around this idea of can we do this securely? Uh, if we're going to roll out this technology, um, can we fix this problem? Um, so Terry launched the company. Um, I came on board um, as I was starting my, my graduate study, which was not the smartest thing in the world because I was going to school full time while working on this startup full time. Um, and it kind of spiraled out of control, but it was OK. Uh, I had good time management <laughs> skills. Um, as I mentioned, the company was based in Colorado, um, very much involved in biometrics, though we did some other things, which I'll talk about. Um, it was operational from 2004 to 2014, so a whole decade this company existed. Um, at its peak, it was still small, but not tiny. Uh, 10 full-time employees and 10 part-time employees. Um, and total revenue in this period was about $7 million, um, which isn't too bad, uh, I think, for that period, especially since um, this period overlaps with the global financial crisis. <laughs> we managed to get through that uh, without any trouble, uh, which was something of a miracle. Um, but coming back to this technology, what were we trying to do? Um, 
It turns out that this security problem I mentioned is, is extraordinarily difficult to solve. Um, so if you know anything about computer vision, you know that when we try to recognize things in a scene or try to do matching in a biometric context, context that matching is always fuzzy. Uh, the sensor never gets the same exact data twice. Um, and this becomes a real nightmare when you think about security, because in the world of security, our knee-jerk reaction when we try to solve this problem is to just uh, deploy encryption. Right? That's easy. There are really good encryption algorithms out there. Uh, right? We have elliptic curves for public key cryptography. We have AES for symmetric key cryptography. Um, those algorithms are reasonably secure. Um, can't we just encrypt the data and call it a day? Um, well, we tried that, and of course, that doesn't work, because if one bit flips, the encrypted representation is completely different. Um, and systems uh, of that era were basically encrypting biometric data and then decrypting it on the fly when you had to match, and then there's no real security because somebody could just steal the data once it's unencrypted. Um, so that's not a very good solution. Um, so we had to think hard about this problem. How exactly could we protect the data in such a way where we guaranteed some cryptographic level uh, of protection, uh, but still we could match in a fuzzy sense? So if bits were flipping as we knew they would, um, we could still match reliably. Um, and so after many years of research, um, Terry came up with this great scheme where you could uh, protect some of the data and leave some of the other data in the clear. Specifically, you could protect the features that were extracted from these images. Um, so the way biometric matching works, if, in case you're not familiar, um, you put, say, your fingerprint down on a sensor. That sensor takes a picture of your fingerprint. Uh, and then the computer system extracts features. And those features are what are used to match. So if you're dealing with fingerprints, as you can see here uh, on the slide, um, you see these interest points uh, in that middle image up there uh, in multiple colors. Those are minutia points. Um, this is where um, you have a ridge ending in your finger, uh, or there's a bifurcation of the ridges. Um, there are these special interest points that forensic examiners or the police use to make uh, matches. Uh, it turns out you can automatically identify these feature points and then use them uh, in a matching process, no problem. Uh, that's how these fingerprint systems have worked for ages. Um, so how do you protect that? Um, some of that data is going to be noisy and some of that data is going to be very stable. If you could figure out what was stable in that fingerprint data and just then apply normal encryption or hashing, you could protect it. And then maybe it's not a big deal if you left the noise in the clear. Um, how much information does that leak about an identity, right? That was an open question we had to look into. Uh, but it turned out to be not that much. So we could reliably protect these fingerprints and then match in this funny encoded space. Um, and what was great about this scheme was that if these tokens we were matching with uh, were compromised, right, like a pin or password, we could regenerate them like a pin or password. No sweat. Uh, and once we could do that, it opened up the door to all sorts of interesting uh, protocols uh, that could facilitate things like mobile payments. Um, so what we ended up doing, um, what was a big part of my um, uh, PhD research, uh, as it turns out, was develop something we called a biometric key infrastructure, uh, which is akin to a public key infrastructure, if you're familiar with uh, security in the internet. Um, so we could manage digital certificates that contained not public keys, uh, but public bio tokens, which you could distribute to other people, other organizations, um, secret data could then be embedded into these tokens, and that data could only be unlocked if the owner presented their biometric. And so we were basically supporting three different modalities, face, fingerprint, and iris to do this. Um, uh, and so that was really the core technology. That's what we were trying to sell. Um, we had the first uh, biometric-enabled payment system through the PayPal API, uh, which was pretty neat. Uh, we had some deployments around uh, uh, the Colorado Springs area. Uh, there were coffee shops where you could go and pay for coffee with just your fingerprint. Great idea. You don't need any other physical tokens. <laughs> you don't even need a, a phone, right? Um, you can just pay with your body. Uh, extremely convenient, especially if you forgot um, you know, some token that you needed uh, uh, for payment. Um, and uh, what was also nice about this, too, is we could make really strong claims about privacy. Um, I think there's a lot more concern about privacy now than there was back then, but we were hopeful back then that people would be interested in uh, privacy protections. Um, and so we had you know, a whole pitch uh, surrounding the, the privacy aspects of this, um, which mostly did not resonate, but I think today would probably resonate a bit more. Um, 
Uh, and so, so again, this was kind of what the company was trying to, to push uh, out into the marketplace. Uh, but of course, I think, I think we were a little bit too early for this technology because the cell phone was just changing into a smartphone at that period. Uh, and so it was hard to get deployments of sensors uh, where we wanted those deployments of sensors. Um, uh, now companies doing the same kind of business, um, like Yambu for instance, um, it's a lot easier for them to obtain either very cheap sensors and get them deployed or just have people use uh, mobile device to, to do the acquisition. Um, but the security aspects are really key to all of this. Um, so we looked at diversifying our business and we did some other things um, that were really interesting in a computer vision sense, uh, but often did stray a little bit from the core mission of the company. Um, so one particularly interesting project was long distance face recognition. Um, so of course we knew, again, it was, it was still the, the sort of um, George W. Bush era in the United States. Uh, security and defense was very much uh, a prevalent industry. Uh, and so we started to look at um, some security applications of technology we were working at. Um, with the mobile biometrics for payments, uh, the secure biometrics work, uh, we were very interested in face recognition uh, because that's a little bit more convenient for the user. Uh, and it turned out then we had a really good technology for doing unconstrained face recognition in surveillance uh, settings. Um, so here was a system uh, that could be deployed autonomously out in various harsh environments. <laughs> it was weatherproof. Um, this strange Star Wars looking droid setup uh, was really just a camera with an embedded uh, computing platform. Uh, it ran off of solar power so it could last for days. Uh, you could stick this somewhere and kind of survey uh, the landscape um, and identify people. Um, and uh, in a few minutes I'll talk about another project where we made uh, a good use of this same setup uh, for a more interesting application. Um, but again, it, it wasn't too hard for us to pivot because we had the base technology, uh, we had some expertise in some of these application areas, um, it made a lot of sense. Um, this problem though is still extremely difficult because on the algorithm side of things, um, you have to deal with very noisy data. This image was taken at night by the way, this is low light, quarter moonlight conditions where we're trying to do face recognition on a fairly low resolution face, um, uh, like you can see here on this target. Um, and so we spent a lot of time thinking about um, how to improve recognition. Yes? Sorry, you said we could... Uh, yeah, please, please, yes. Um, you said you pivoted. So that means the other technology didn't sell enough, or...? Ah, very good question. Um, initially, yes. Um, there was not as much traction as we had hoped for that application in the consumer space. Um, so the pivot was kind of necessary to keep the company going as we kept searching for customers on the business development side for that technology. And I'll loop back around, when I get to the end of this part, you'll see that there's, there's a happy ending for that, that biometric payment story. <laughs> so it was, it was not a complete failure, um, but it was not an easy sell like we thought it would be when the company was formed. Um, so we started working on things like this um, about five years after the inception of the company. But that's a great question. Yeah, feel free, again, if anybody else has questions, let me know. Um, other, other security applications we looked at too. So um, that was face recognition at a long distance uh, on the ground. What if we were on a boat? That might be interesting. Um, so in 2011, if you were familiar with the global security news, you may have been reading stories about pirates. Yes, there were pirates in the Red Sea. Um, and various governments were very upset about this. Um, so the United States Navy came to us and asked us, can you do face recognition from one boat to another boat? Which is challenging because the boats are bobbing up and down. Um, it was the same long distance scenario. We were very interested in the low light conditions again. Uh, but now we had this additional constraint of there was motion. Um, so now we had to think really hard. Um, and again, this is before the deep learning revolution, quote unquote. Um, face recognition algorithms by today's standards were fairly primitive. Um, what was the best we could do in this situation. So we started to look at um, various um, post hoc score analysis uh, mechanisms to try to understand if a recognition system gave us a result, could we trust it? Um, so we, we were trying to triage the bad results. Uh, and so we developed a really interesting extreme value theory based system to uh, make predictions over recognition scores. Um, uh, and this let us uh, throw out a lot of bad data, which would be uh, potentially harmful if an analyst were looking at it. Um, and so this became a really, really great avenue of research that led to our later work on open set recognition. Um, so a lot of interesting academic oriented research came out of some of this more applied work that we were doing. 
Um, another really fun project, um, which uh, again in retrospect um, sort of had a lot of commercial value, um, this search engine for faces called Face Tracer. Um, so this was before visual search was very popular uh, and we're very good for, for that matter. Um, so this is a paper we had at CVPR in 2012. Um, the idea here is if you had a database of millions of faces, how could you search it with natural language queries that mapped really well to visual appearance? Um, so this isn't a matter of matching that query to uh, textual metadata that was available for these faces, right? Input into the system by somebody. Um, we generated that metadata automatically by um, applying visual attribute classifiers to the face. So we could figure out um, things like, you know, who is male in this database? Who is female? Who has a pointy nose in this database? Who has a round nose? Hair color, um, uh, expression, who's smiling, who's frowning, who's wearing jewelry, who's wearing makeup. All these different things were automatically classified by the computer vision system. Uh, and then we were able to search this system um, uh, using some fusion techniques that the company had developed. Um, so there were some really interesting, uh, uh, you know, basic consumer facing uh, 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 applications here, just visual search. Uh, also some interesting security related applications for this too. Uh, imagine large databases of suspects you're trying to search through if there is a crime. Um, and, and this system uh, for the time was the largest ever constructed um, uh, up until that point. So we were able to do about uh, two million faces uh, in real time. Uh, so it also was an interesting exercise in distributed <laughs> processing and distributed computing, uh, which was not uh, as advanced uh, back in 2012 as it is now. Um, it's funny to think it wasn't that long ago, but we've come uh, uh, almost orders of magnitude uh, in progress uh, away from where we were uh, uh, for some of these technologies. Okay, so I mentioned, so we were doing in some of this, this surveillance work. Um, there were some other interesting applications that were easy for us to tackle in a certain sense um, that made use of a lot of the technology we had developed. Um, so one that was really cool, um, we had a project to, um, uh, for a customer to automatically identify animals and conduct population surveys. Um, the idea here in, in America, and I'm sure this is true in Chile as well, um, there are threatened and endangered animals that have certain protections under the, the law. In, in the United States, there are federal laws um, that protect these animals. Uh, and you can't go around destroying their habitats, squashing them. Uh, in this case, the customer was the United States Air Force. Um, they did not want to blow them up when they were you know, practicing their bombing runs out, out at these uh, Air Force bases in the middle of nowhere. Um, so we had a project with Edwards Air Force Base, which is very remote. It's in the Mojave Desert, uh, north of Los Angeles. Um, it's a very harsh environment. It's one of the strangest environments I've ever visited. Um, uh, also very beautiful, uh, but it's not visited very often by anybody because it's so remote. Um, and a lot of these animals live there. Um, and so uh, the Air Force uh, felt it could save money by developing a computer system that could automatically look for these animals, conduct population surveys. They wouldn't have to send biologists out into the field for months to try to figure out where these habitats were, uh, to try to study the animals and understand how many were living in a, per a certain area so they could rope that area off. Um, there, were, there was also interesting commercial value to this application as well, though. Um, uh, it turns out there are many, um, uh, you know, naturalists and sort of, you know, hobbyist animal watchers and also hunters in the United States <laughs> um, that are very interested in, in tracking animals, watching animals, studying animals. Uh, and they buy a lot of technology related to this, a lot of camera systems, um, a lot of, um, uh, you know, computer, now it would be computer vision related systems to help them try to automatically uh, identify animals and, and the such. Um, and so this, this became an interesting commercial outlet for you know, some of this video-based surveillance work we had been doing incorporating biometrics. Here it was really biometrics though for animals, um, specifically the desert tortoise and the Mojave ground squirrel, which is an extremely rare animal as I found out. You don't really see it that often at all. Um, and so the popular press picked up on this, uh, various wildlife federations thought this was a great idea. Um, and it was a really nice positive technology, right? We were kind of helping the environment um, uh, and studying a really cool, difficult computer vision problem uh, along the way. Um, so none of these projects were boring. That was an exciting part about the startup. Uh, number one, since we, we kind of were in charge of the company, uh, we could kind of figure out what we wanted to work on. So we pursued things that we were interested in, uh, but we made sure that those things could generate revenue for the company so we could keep working at the company and build value. Um, 
but, but it wasn't like a traditional job where we were just kind of, you know, in an office somewhere in a giant company, slinging code, right, for some, some really boring office application. Um, these are really fascinating questions that really get at the heart of, of vision and what it means to perceive uh, scenes and objects in these things. So it got me thinking a lot about um, how vision works. Um, so I mentioned again, like there were some ups and downs, and I mentioned again, we had to pivot kind of early on because um, the, the market wasn't quite there for the technology we really wanted to sell. Um, and so that was one set of problems, but we, we got through them no problem because we kept finding other customers that saw potential in what we were doing, saw other applications for what we were doing, and we were able to move that technology somewhere else. Um, but now things get a little bit more rocky. Um, so what, what went wrong here? This is the, the next question we're gonna pose. Um, and this is, again, many things can go wrong in a startup. I've seen many things go wrong in a startup. I think the most common thing is you run out of money. That was not Securix's problem. In fact, um, the problem I'm gonna talk about like, affected us because we had too much revenue booked and it was hard to solve the problem that had to be solved because there was a little bit too much money. Um, so that wasn't it. Um, clash of personalities, that's always a problem. You wanna build a good team when you're building a startup, um, especially early stage, like the team is really it. Like, that's where your value is uh, because you probably don't have a technology yet. Um, and so, you know, if investors are gonna put money into your company, um, they're gonna be looking at the team. If you have the wrong team, it's just not gonna work. Um, and, po you know, promising impossible things, that's another thing startups tend to do regularly, and, and that's another reason they fail. That wasn't the problem here either. These were very practical systems that worked, um, especially working for a guy like Terry Bolt, who's very well known in the computer vision community for being able to get things to work where other people simply make promises. You know, that was kind of reassuring. We knew what we were doing on the engineering side. It could solve these problems. Um, so what went wrong? Let's dig into this. Um, so, so Terry is awesome. Like, I can't say enough good things about Terry Bolt. Um, he was the CEO and CTO of this company, Securix. Um, it was really his brainchild. Um, he really put in the hard work at the beginning to get it off the ground. Um, and he was really committed to both the business and the technology, so that's why he had both these roles. Um, and Terry, Terry's really well known in the computer vision community for many things. Um, here, here's some of the stuff he was doing while he was the CEO and CTO of this company. Um, so he was also still working full time as a professor. He did not step uh, away from his university role. So he was both uh, teaching uh, and he was um, uh, doing research. He had a huge university group. Uh, remember at the beginning of this, I was his PhD student. Um, I eventually graduated and then joined the company full time, but I was working sort of on the company while I was a student. But he had many students. He had a huge group, one of the largest in the uh, CS department uh, at UCCS. Um, and so he had all of his normal duties on top of you know, the company, which is a lot of work, right? So just doing that would be enough for any mere mortal. Uh, but it wasn't enough for Terry. Um, so he was doing some other stuff. Um, while we were doing the company, while he was doing all this research, um, he was trying to launch his own type of degree at the University of Colorado. This isn't a new major. This was a fundamentally new uh, degree he called the Bachelor of Innovation. Uh, so in the United States, you typically get um, a diploma when you graduate which says Bachelor of Arts, Bachelor of Science, uh, Bachelor of Engineering. Those are, those are the more common ones. Um, Terry thought of this new one which would combine both uh, business and technology because that's what he loved, that's what he was interested in. Um, he was very much you know, in favor of innovation in general. Uh, so he launched what he called the Bachelor of Innovation uh, where you could study both of these things and it wasn't a major, it was really a, a a solid degree program. It wasn't a double major type of situation. Um, and so he, he just came up with this idea. He formulated the proposal to the university. Uh, he was pitching the like, regents of the university on this and eventually he got it approved. He then created the, the core curriculum for this, this new program. Uh, he was teaching a lot of classes. So it says two plus here. In the beginning, he was teaching about two courses. Then he ramped up to about four or five and six as, as time went on per semester, which I've never seen anybody do, period. Um, uh, he, yeah, advising lots of students, um, publishing fantastic research um, at premier venues within uh, computer vision, uh, CVPR, ECCV, transactions on pattern analysis and machine intelligence, all the, the good places in computer vision. Uh, but he wasn't satisfied with just doing that. He also wanted to run the conferences. Uh, so he was the general chair and program chair of CVPR 2011, which Domingo went to. 
Yeah, this is that was Terry doing all that as well. Uh, I helped out though. Um, so that's that's like people will will step back and and not teach at all when they're the general chair of one of these giant computer science conferences. Not Terry. He just had too much energy. He had to do that as well. Um, and so. <laughs> Again, this is a real testament to the man who works more than anybody I know, Terry Bolt. Uh, but it was also um, a looming problem for the company because Terry was so overcommitted. Um, and so what happened eventually, and again, I've never seen this happen at a company before, but it happened to us. Um, enough was enough. Terry's wife, Ginger, who's here at the bottom. Th this is not a real photo, by the way. This is <laughs> Photoshop. Besides, so besides doing all that stuff, Terry did like to do some other things in, in his, his copious spare time. One of those things was snowboarding. Because we were in Colorado, so skiing, snowboarding, right? All sorts of winter sports are really popular, like they are here, I'm guessing. Um, so Terry would, would take some time off and go snowboarding. Um, uh, and his wife would go skiing. Uh, and so eventually his wife had had enough, and she said, just choose one job. Right? It's, it's fine if you want to put a lot of energy into something, but just, just scale back to one of these things. Don't try to do all of them. Um, and so Terry then you know, was faced with this dilemma. He was like, well, I can't, you know, I can't tell Ginger I'm going to keep doing this because she's you know, had it with, with me. I have to do something. Um, and so he, he thought long and hard, and eventually he settled on continuing to become, be a professor. He, he had always been a professor. Um, he really, at, at his heart, was, was an academic. He loved teaching. He had just launched this new Bachelor of Innovation degree program. Um, and so in the summer of 2011, he announced to the company um, at um, a, a party we had that um, he was going to sell the company, but don't worry, we would have a buyer soon. That's what, that's what he told us. Um, so another thing with startups, you cannot make predictions like this accurately. That never works. <laughs> um, we had a lot of good technology. We had a great team. Uh, but there was no guarantee that we were going to sell the company quickly. Um, that's extremely difficult to do. Um, but Terry, Terry had some leads. Um, we had some good de business development people. Um, it wasn't out of the question. Um, but it still made a lot of folks pretty nervous, right? We had, remember, 20 people working at this company. Uh, some people were married, they had kids, right? A family to support. You know, what would be going through your mind if your boss came to you and said, no, I'm shutting this down, but don't worry, it'll be fine. No, no big deal. Um, right? Reality check, a successful exit takes a long time to orchestrate. Most of the, the companies I've seen exit, um, you know, friends and, and, and colleagues who have had companies, it takes a very long time. You know, 10 plus years of really hard work uh, uh, to make this happen. Um, and it just does not happen overnight, uh, um, you know, no matter how awesome you think your, your technology is. Um, so we had that to deal with. So naturally what happened, which, which again, like when trouble sets in at a company, you'll see this, this same effect, a mass exodus. <laughs> people started to leave. Um, and you can see this is a list of, of really outstanding people. Um, uh, these are some of my favorite people that I've worked with. Um, I respect all of them. And I did not fault them for bailing on Securex after this announcement was made. Um, and you can see, see here where kind of people went. We did have a president uh, on the business side of things, along with uh, Terry acting as CEO. Um, he simply retired. He <laughs> had enough. Um, we had a business development uh, uh, guy, Matthew Ennis, who was spectacular. Um, he went on uh, to work with another startup, which was acquired by Novetta, which is a large government services provider. Um, Chris Eberly was one of our software engineers. He went off to Amazon. Ben Cable, another software engineer, Google. So you can see we had a great team. These, these people were being snatched up. It wasn't hard for them to find other, other opportunities. Um, some, some of us decamped for the Ivy League. Um, eventually, I, I saw another opportunity uh, back in academia. Uh, so I joined um, David Cox's group uh, at Harvard University. Um, we had another student um, who was working at the company who, who decided to do a PhD uh, and went to Cornell. Um, uh, another software engineer went to PayPal, et cetera. So like, really awesome people, really outstanding team. Um, but this really affects you. When, when people start to leave, morale plunges, right? Other people then decide, OK, if people are getting good jobs, I can probably find a good job too. Let me go see what my, my options are. Um, and, and things had to wind down. Uh, but it took a long time. The ultimate fate of Securix here, um, this is a slide I made last year. So I've given this talk in various forms in the past. Um, and, and it was kind of a sad story um, uh, up until last year. 
So the office officially closed in the fall of 2014. So remember, Terry announced that he was um, uh, looking for a buyer and closing the company in the summer of 2011. Uh, so it took him over three years to wind things down because the company was so successful, because we had all these customers, we had contracts to fulfill, um, uh, we had to have uh, uh, some people working. Uh, and so, so Terry, you know, with a skeleton crew at the very end, managed to fulfill all of the existing contracts. Uh, the last contract actually completed in January of 2015. So there was no physical office. There was, there was one person, I think, with Terry working remotely just to wrap up some, some last uh, bits and pieces of the work. Um, and then Terry was still out there, though, with a very interesting and a very valuable, as it turns out, IP portfolio. Um, and so, again, like when I was giving this talk uh, at an entrepreneurship class um, at, at Notre Dame, this is kind of where the story ended. Um, but then, remarkably, uh, Terry, <laughs> Terry came to me last year and said, you know, guess what? Like, I sold Securix. We sold the company. And I was like, R really? Like, there's, nobody works at this company. What did you sell? Um, the intellectual property is what he sold. He found a buyer for the IP. Um, and, and amazingly, the, the company was to, um, you know, technically acquired. Um, so a very large biometrics vendor um, was very interested in that technology where we were protecting biometric features and doing things like supporting uh, mobile transactions, right? Because now in 2018, um, that technology is extremely valuable, right? It's like we do all of these mobile payments all the time. Biometrics are more pervasive. Um, of course, you would want good security for that because almost every company selling uh, systems doing such things are not doing it in a secure way. Um, eventually, a biometrics vendor figured all this out um, and, and purchased all of the intellectual property. That would be the patents. Uh, that would be um, uh, the software that had been developed, uh, all of the documentation. Um, and that was that. Um, so really cool. So it was really a success story in the end, even though it seemed to be a sinking ship um, uh, for many years. Uh, we were happy that there was a good outcome. So an unusual story, but I think you know, um, the story of each startup is unique, and you'll encounter all sorts of interesting things. Um, uh, and you have to be aware of you know, the good and the bad. Um, so it's an interesting tale I like to tell. And certainly, for me, it was a great experience. I learned so much by doing this. Uh, even though, again, it got rocky at the end, um, I think, I, I, you know, given the choice to do it again now, I would have still done it because I learned all the ins and outs of um, uh, how to do a startup. Uh, remember, it's a small company, so you have to do a lot of different things, things um, that involve skills you probably didn't have when you started working at the company. For instance, uh, management, accounting, <laughs> uh, things you don't really learn as a computer scientist in the classroom, but things you really need when you're going to have a successful business. Um, so I picked all of that up along the way, and it was just amazing, amazing experience. OK, so that's story number one. Now I'm going to talk about story number two, uh, which is ongoing. Uh, Perceptive Automata. Uh, what is this company? Um, so I mentioned I, I went back into academia, um, was hanging out at Harvard, working with some really cool neuroscientists and computer scientists thinking about artificial intelligence. Uh, working on some really interesting technologies, incorporating uh, measurements of neural data, uh, behavioral measurements of, of human behavior, animal behavior, et cetera, into machine learning models, and seeing that it was making the models better, and in some cases more consistent with uh, human behavior. Uh, and of course, if you can do that, all sorts of interesting commercial opportunities can come around the corner, and maybe you can address uh, some of these things. Um, so we formed this company, Perceptive Automata, uh, to try to bring this um, biologically inspired computer vision to the marketplace. Um, so a little bit about what we're doing now. So this company went through a number of pivots too, and I won't go into the gory details of those. Um, but what we settled on eventually was um, uh, understanding human behavior for the purposes of safety, specifically autonomous vehicles. A big thing that is missing from basically all of the autonomous systems, even the very best autonomous systems that are out there, um, is some understanding of human psychology. Um, right? The psychology of driving is extremely important. You as a human intuit how pedestrians are behaving on the road. Right? You as a human sort of intuit what other drivers are doing, even if you don't have a good view of them. Um, and you're doing this almost subconsciously because perception is operating faster than um, you can think about something actively. Um, so wouldn't it be great if we had capabilities for assessing road safety 
um, that we're using some of the same processes that the brain is using. Um, so that's the major idea here behind this particular company. Um, so we formed the company when I was still there. Um, I am still an academic, obviously. I don't work at this company full time. My role is really as an advisor and as a founder. Um, but I really wanted to see this, this technology get out there because I felt it was important. Um, I think autonomous vehicles will be amazing if we can get them to work, right? I mean, this will be a revolutionary technology. Um, and I think we'll see it in our lifetimes, hopefully within uh, 10 years. That's my prediction at the moment. I know a lot of other companies are predicting the end of this year or next year. Uh, but given the state of the technology, I think that is very optimistic. Um, and so, so yeah, so I'm, I'm, still, I'm still actively involved in this, this effort to um, improve road safety. Um, and so I'm excited that I can actually talk about this company uh, because for a long time we were in stealth mode. Um, so a lot of companies, you know, especially startups, they don't want to reveal too much about what they're doing. Um, they don't want to talk too much about um, you know, their business activities or their R&D efforts um, because they want some advantage in the marketplace when they do uh, reveal what they're doing. Uh, but the good news is two, year, two weeks ago we unveiled this company uh, and now the popular press uh, is on top of it and I can show you um, a cool video that explains what we're doing. Um, it's no longer a secret. Um, and then I'm going to talk a bit about the research that we're doing on the computer vision side of things um, that's powering some of this. Um, and it's all published research so it's, it, no secrets are being uh, uh, divulged here. Um, but again, uh, this really comes down to this question of safety. Um, so we have, let me play the video here, whoops. I'll give you a sense of what we're doing. I hope this works. I apologize if it's too loud. Reflect on driving for a moment. The road is a place where, beyond just the rules and geometries of the road, we constantly communicate with each other in many critical nonverbal ways. There's the obvious hand wave and head nod, of course, but just as important are the many signals subtle body language conveys to others. We are able to effortlessly predict other people's intentions by simply observing them. The challenge for today's autonomous vehicles is that they are only able to detect the location and motion of people, but not their intention. They can't anticipate what people might do next which makes them paranoid drivers and unable to operate on our roads. Until now, a technology company out of Harvard and MIT has figured out a way to give machines the ability to understand human behavior so that autonomous vehicles can drive safer and smoother. In the task of driving, in the task of interacting with people on the road, was one of these situations, was a kind of judgment where you were looking at another human and, and you're using this human cognitive capacity to, to build a model of what's in their head, to understand their state of mind. And understanding state of mind is exactly the kind of problem where humans are, are effortlessly good at, unbelievably good at. In fact, there's a pretty good argument from the research literature that this ability to look at another human and understand them is at the core of human intelligence. It's the single thing that differentiates us from other primates. My dad and I always talked about, he, he's a trauma surgeon, so we always talked about how there would be so many more, there would be so many more accidents, so many more injuries and deaths in India, but he's surprised that there aren't. And I think part of it is this, this reason that, that we started this company is because we have this incredible facility as humans to do things on the road that we just don't know we have. And so even if the environment's terrible and messy and it's hard to know what someone's going to do next, we figure it out. All the pedestrians they see are going to have a thought bubble above their head. In that thought bubble, they're going to have an indication for intention. They want to cross in front of the car. And an awareness of this little eye. Do they know that the car is there? What our system does is use all of those pixels um, and really tries to pull out whatever the features are, right? So it could be eyes, it could be their posture, it could be their expression, it could be they're holding a cell phone, it could be they're holding a, a heavy cup of coffee so they're holding it close to themselves because they don't want to spill it when they walk, it could be that they're, they're picking up a bag, it could be that they have a heavy bag that they seem like they're going to put down and they they're not going to cross, it could be that they're, that they're kind of looking at a car, which means they're maybe in the car or get in the trunk and they're not gonna, uh, not gonna even though they're in the street, they're not gonna cross the street. So it uses, it uses all of the, these two paths. There's 
the dystopia path where we take ourselves out of our own cities to make room for robots. And then there's the utopian path where getting rid of the dependence on driving vehicles makes for shared environments that are better for everyone. Okay, so that would hopefully give you a little bit of a flavor of what perceptive automata is doing. Um, I, I think it's very timely uh, uh, in terms of the, the application, in terms of the technology, uh, and also the importance is really there. Uh, this is a key missing piece, as I mentioned, um, uh, and, and what this video emphasizes too. Um, that, that really needs to be addressed if we're going to get these cars on the road interacting with other road users, right, that are not uh, other autonomous vehicles. Um, this is the team. I, in fact, the team has grown since this picture was taken uh, at the beginning of the summer. Uh, I think we've got four more people that have just been hired. So this is a rapidly growing enterprise, um, which is exciting to see. And, and this team is phenomenal. I mean, I love the Securix team. I love these guys just as much. Um, I think the talent we've assembled here um, is really incredible. Um, uh, so what I want to do now is just give you a, a little bit more in terms of the details of, of what what are we doing in terms of thinking about neuroscience and psychology and how does that feed back into um, this idea of AI helping us uh, understand things on the road? Uh, and very importantly, um, uh, I really, a lot of my current research is trying to understand these claims that are being made about human level or superhuman level performance, right? Some of them seem suspicious. Um, so it'd be really nice if we could figure out um, if these claims are, are true. And number two, this is really important for what perceptive automata is doing uh, because we are making those claims, right? We're trying to say that our system is perceiving the world uh, in a similar manner to uh, people. Well, how do we falsify that claim internally, right? We need some facility to do that. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the research that's behind this. Um, so imagine the following scenario. Um, you have a proprietary autonomous vehicle system that purportedly solves driving with human-like ability. Um, think how many claims you've heard about this in the news, probably many, right? Think Waymo, Tesla, Uber, right? They all have superhuman driving capabilities. This will be on the road, you know, accident-free, end of the year. Um, and they do try to back it up in some cases. Um, uh, so we can imagine in our hypothetical here, by all accounts, the software achieves superior performance on established computer vision benchmarks. So if you're familiar with uh, computer vision or AI at large, you probably know that we gauge performance using benchmark data sets. Um, in the case of computer vision, these are large collections of images or videos um, that are usually collected from the internet. Um, and we train our systems on these uh, images or videos, and then we evaluate our systems uh, using some other data from that same collection. Um, and this is important because we need to do controlled experiments uh, to understand if we're making progress, but it's also extremely dangerous, as it turns out. Um, so a question would be then, how would you go about falsifying this claim of human likability, right? You probably would start with the data sets, I'd imagine. Um, but then we end up with this scenario. Has anybody seen this thought experiment before? The Chinese room? Okay, <laughs> one, one person is familiar, that's good. Um, this is a very famous thought experiment in uh, philosophy. Um, so it was posed by John Searle in the early 1980s. Um, and Searle is well known for um, uh, thinking about artificial intelligence in a sort of you know, more humanistic, philosophical manner. Uh, he's not uh, a computer scientist or engineer. Um, but he does have some reasonable insight when it comes to these things. Um, so here's the Chinese room. Let me explain what this is and why it's important for what I'm talking about. Um, in the Chinese room scenario, um, you have a person locked in a room, and this person does not know Chinese. Um, but this person has access to this book, which allows him to look up Chinese characters, which are inserted by someone else who is outside of the room. Uh, and then can uh, figure out the message's response by just reading this book. Um, no idea what these symbols mean, doesn't really matter, uh, because the person in the box knows that um, uh, the book has all of the answers. And then uh, he can write on another uh, sort of block here what the answer should be and put it in the output side of the room and someone else who speaks Chinese um, uh, gets the answer. And so the dilemma here is, um, do the people outside of the box realize that the man in the box does not know Chinese? Um, by all outwards appearances, he seems to know Chinese perfectly. 
right? And no matter what query they pose, the correct answer in Chinese comes back out of the room. Um, but all this really is, in a computer science sense, is a lookup table. Um, there's a lot of knowledge in this book. Uh, all you have to do is consult the book to get the answer, and everything appears correct. Um, so if you think about deep learning, say, and what it's doing, it's not altogether different from this situation. If you have a network with many millions of parameters and a large labeled training data set, maybe what's happening is that you are memorizing that training data set. And as long as the testing data is similar enough to that training data, you're going to get the right answer out of the network because it's basically this lookup table. Um, and that becomes a huge problem because the performance on a data set could look remarkably good, but when you put it on the autonomous vehicle and set it out in the world, the car is crashing in weird places, which shouldn't happen uh, if it has actually learned the structure and operation and function of the environment, uh, which in many cases it hasn't. Um, so here we have traditional data set testing, which again is, I'm not saying we shouldn't do this. I'm saying we should probably think about some alternatives. Um, here we might have the situation where we have the data set, we have some collection of algorithms. Here we're just looking at two algorithms labeled A and B. Um, if we look at, um, say, the um, classification performance, the top one accuracy and the top five accuracy, um, it looks like algorithm B is better than algorithm A. It definitively beats algorithm A in accuracy in both of these cases. Um, but what we're looking at at Perceptive Automata, and also in my laboratory especially, the use of visual psychophysics as an alternative. Um, so what is psychophysics, you say? Um, maybe you've heard this term if you've taken a psychology course, um, but if not, I'll explain it. Um, the idea with psychophysics is that you're going to have some fine-grained control over a particular variable involved in the experiment. Um, and you're going to manipulate this variable in such a way um, that's going to be sort of slowly perturbed over and over and over. And eventually what you're going to try to do is break the perceptual system once that variable hits a point where it breaks recognition capability. Um, so what does that mean? Uh, for instance, uh, Gaussian blur. We can think about motion blur in environment, right, which would be very important for robotics and autonomous driving uh, applications. Um, you're going to encounter blur in some measure out there in the real world. Um, what if we start uh, with uh, some images from a data set and we incrementally perturb those images uh, ever so slowly until we've hit a certain point uh, where we can say this, this system is no longer safe. The, it's in operation, it is going to fail. Uh, because there is too much blur in the scene. Um, that's basically it. And of course, this is not a new idea in computer vision or psychology. In psychology, this is a very well-established um, uh, mechanism for testing. Uh, in computer vision, we've done a lot of work um, adding things like Gaussian blur, linear occlusion, rotation, et cetera, to um, uh, different stimuli, giving these to systems and seeing where they break. Uh, a big problem was that we didn't use the exact protocols that were used by psychologists. We would often just randomly sample an image from the data set, uh, start messing around with it, and maybe only try it five or ten times and then give up. Say, you know, it worked or it didn't work. Um, uh, we didn't really do uh, the same type of analysis that is performed in psychology, where you construct these things called item response curves. Um, so here on the x-axis for each of these plots, we would see um, these perturbations uh, increasing as we go uh, from here to uh, there, uh, from some sort of left to right on the x-axis. Um, and then also uh, on the y-axis, we would see that accuracy. You know, how is the system changing as we change the measure of blur or linear occlusion of rotation, et cetera? Um, and if you do this analysis, you can see something interesting happening. Um, it looks like, uh, just from these plots, uh, um, algorithm A is better than algorithm B when it comes to Gaussian blur and linear occlusion, uh, but not so when it comes to rotation. That's something we would never learn from the summary statistics we're computing in computer vision data set benchmark testing land. Um, that's a huge problem, because when the system fails, we don't know why it's failing. Uh, all we care about is sort of beating the benchmark. But you can imagine a situation where in the data set, um, one of these algorithms, like algorithm B, is failing on every image that has uh, some form of occlusion over the object. Um, uh, unless we could you know, distill this out of the data set, we would never know that from the summary statistic. Um, and this could be extremely dangerous because we have a lot of trust in that system because it appears to be the best from the data set result. But in the real world, it is not good at all. Um, it's pretty terrible. Um, so psychophysics is really well known in, in broader vision science. Um, I'm not quite sure why 
Um, it hasn't come into uh, play in computer vision until we introduced it a few years ago. Um, but it's extremely useful. Um, in fact, some very important findings within biological vision um, have happened uh, thanks in part to psychophysics. Uh, for instance, the minimum amount of light uh, that stimulates a photoreceptor in the retina was discovered through a psychophysics experiment. It turns out that that amount of light, any guesses how much light, what's the minimum amount of light that will activate uh, a photoreceptor, a neuron in your retina? How many photons? Anybody, anybody, any guess? No ideas? Is it a big number, or a small number? Small, it's very small. In fact, it's just one photon. Right? And so with psychophysics, you can control light to that le level of specificity. Uh, and then all of a sudden, right, you can say, I've got one photon of light. I see an action potential firing from this cell. I know it, the cell has been activated. Um, that's pretty remarkable. Um, and so, so that's the kind of control we have uh, with psychophysics. Even better, we can turn to procedurally rendered graphics. Um, so now we can throw out a lot of noise, right, which is kind of uh, vexing when it comes to these experiments. Um, and we know everything in terms of the parameters that were used to generate the scene. And so we know when we're controlling for our variable and starting to add some condition like rotation or linear occlusion, Gaussian blur, lighting, et cetera, it's that which is breaking the recognition system. And that's really, really important because that's what we're going to want to fix then in the model. Um, so the first thing I'll talk about, um, this is um, a paper that's going to appear very soon in TPAMI, uh, Visual Psychophysics for Object Recognition. Um, this is a joint collaboration between my lab, uh, my graduate student Brandon Richard Webster, uh, and Perceptive Automata, automata uh, so Sam Anthony, who was in the video, which you just saw, who is our CTO, uh, and a card-carrying psychologist, um, and uh, a very uh, close collaborator of mine when it comes to this research. Um, so how do you do this in computer vision world? So again, getting away from traditional data set testing, but we're still going to use our data sets. Um, what we'll do is either take some images from um, natural scenes, so you can think of a, a data set uh, like Coco or ImageNet, or we could use procedurally rendered graphics. We could uh, take object models from a data set like ShapeNet. Um, uh, so we could use computer graphics, render those scenes. Um, and then what's really important, what we're going to do um, is find what we call a preferred view. Um, and so this is what was really missing from a lot of the previous computer vision testing in this area. Um, instead of just randomly choosing images and changing them, like uh, the countless papers that had, had done perturbations before had done, uh, what we're going to do is um, run a bunch of images through a recognition system and figure out which ones uh, we get really good recognition performance on. And we're going to call those the preferred view. Um, so it turns out that all of you have a preferred um, uh, view for objects. Um, when you're looking at a specific object, there is a pose um, that allows you to recognize that object quickly. Um, and that kind of makes sense, right? When I'm standing in front of my laptop, I can see the keyboard, I can see the screen. You know, obviously, this is my preferred view for a laptop. But if I'm off at a strange angle, maybe over here and I'm kind of far away, the back of the laptop isn't ideal. I can probably still figure out what it is, but it may take me a little bit longer to do that. Um, it turns out with algorithms, you see the same phenomenon. Um, if you look at the recognition scores coming out of the system, so if it's a convolutional neural network, maybe you're looking at uh, the softmax output, um, you'll see these scores. Um, and you want to figure out, you know, is there a point uh, where I'm finding images uh, for an object category that are getting a perfect score or at least a very high score compared to all the other images. Those are the ones you're going to harvest for the preferred view. Um, you can do the same thing with computer graphics. Um, and then once you have this, now you know that once you start perturbing the images, um, you're starting from hopefully near perfect performance and you're degrading that performance. And you'll know what's going on in terms of problems because you are controlling the problem. Uh, and so you're going to transform the images with whatever transformation function you like. And then you're going to generate those item response curves, which I showed you. And that's what you're going to use then for the analysis. Um, and what's fun here is you can start to formulate tasks that are a little bit different from traditional tasks in computer vision, but more like the tasks that psychologists use to test human vision. Uh, for instance, a two alternative forced choice task might look like this uh, when you're testing uh, uh, natural vision. So you have some sample stimulus, right? Obviously, it's a plane. I think we can see that. Um, this will flash up on the screen. It will then disappear. Uh, and then we'll have two choices to look at. Um, a matching alternate stimulus, which is just um, a different pose uh, for this plane. And then a non-matching alternate stimulus, which in this case is a dog. Um, and we can look at these images and then select the one um, uh, that matches. 
Um, and it's not really this easy for people. We usually do uh, rapid presentation time uh, to knock people off of ceiling. So they only get um, you know, maybe 50 milliseconds to look at uh, the stimuli, and then they have to make their choice in terms of what, what the object pair that matches is. Um, we can do s the same thing with algorithms. Um, so here is that same type of experiment um, run against five different convolutional neural networks, AlexNet, CafeNet, GoogleNet, and two different variants of uh, VGG. Um, and you can see here um, the condition is Gaussian blur. You can also see um, that we're using uh, rendered stimuli. So we controlled um, all of the, the parameters of the scene. Um, and you can see we also started from preferred views that were perfect, um, which is good. And what we started to do then was to crank up the sigma of the Gaussian blur. So we got blurrier and blurrier images, as you can see going across the x-axis here. Um, and what's fascinating about this plot is we can see a tremendous amount of diversity in the behavior of these uh, neural networks, including the two variants of VGG, which are almost the same architecture. Um, all of these uh, uh, networks are also trained with ImageNet, so they saw the same data. Uh, but their, perf their performance rate or their behavior is very different depending on the level of blur. Um, and we can see that um, these networks are all heavily impacted by blur, uh, which is bad, especially for autonomous vehicles, right? Because the vehicle is going to be driving, there's going to be motion blur. Um, and if we're trying to identify objects in the scene, especially trying to identify um, objects that may be threats to the car, um, safety situations, this isn't so good. Um, and what's really cool about this experimental regime is that you can also um, have a, a more consistent comparison with human vision. So here is a performance point where we showed humans um, a similar task. Um, uh, and then uh, the only real difference between, in this case, the human and the computer experimentation is that the humans only got uh, uh, the stimuli for uh, a fraction of a second whereas the computer always makes an instantaneous decision because it's a computer. Um, that said, the experimental regime was, was more or less matched. Um, and we can see that human vision in this case is much better when it comes to the condition of blur. Uh, we are well adapted to uh, recognizing blurry objects because we are often in motion ourselves uh, quite frequently. Um, so we would have gotten none of this from the data set if we were just looking at the ImageNet summary statistics. That would not have popped out at us. Um, rotation. Um, because we're using uh, computer graphics in some cases, we can manipulate the objects in space. So rotation becomes important because we know we can potentially look at objects in all sorts of different configurations. So here's rotation in the x-axis. We can see here that the networks are a bit more invariant to rotation, which is kind of what we would expect from deep learning. Um, that said, it's not perfectly invariant, um, especially for this upside down rabbit case here. Um, over uh, uh, that particular uh, configuration of object, um, we see that there is a spread, um, and in some cases, VGG19, in fact, um, sinks down to 80% accuracy. That's not necessarily good. It's not as awful as the blur situation, but not great. Uh, we can see that people are better than that. Uh, but the good news is it looks like um, CafeNet and GoogleNet are basically matching human performance for that particular pose. Um, so that's really good to see. This is a case where we can say uh, the models are consistent with human behavior. Um, but that's a pretty simple task, right? That's kind of you know, a basic pair matching task in computer vision. Um, we know that we're more interested in these large scale um, categorization tasks. Um, so in the MAFC task, um, we generalize to M number of different matching stimuli. So again, we have a probe image. Uh, in this case, we have a full-blown classification model where we have lots of different choices in terms of uh, potential matches. And the idea is you know, we're going to go through all of these categories and figure out uh, what the most probable one is. And hopefully, we make the correct match. Um, so that would be a plane in this case. Um, and so looking at this case, which I think is a bit more realistic for the case of driving, um, we came to some interesting conclusions. Um, it turns out that these um, convolutional neural networks have a very curious contrast deficit, which is opposite to what humans usually have uh, when they have a, a contrast deficit uh, in their, their vision. Um, so I'm, I'm sure some of you have heard of night blindness, right? Some people have trouble driving in the dark. They can't see well in the dark. Uh, and this could be fairly debilitating um, uh, if you have to get around in a car late at night. Um, we typically have little to no trouble with higher contrast images. Uh, we can typically resolve images even that have been artificially uh, contrast enhanced uh, without any trouble. In fact, this is kind of you know, a lousy projector and you're sitting kind of far away, but you can probably still tell um, this is a plane in all of these, these images. Um, it hasn't been uh, distorted to the point where you can't figure out where it, what it is. Um, 
Uh, but the, the same is not true when it comes to uh, decreasing contrast, which is basically, right, you're losing uh, information about the object, and this is simulating uh, night blindness. Um, so here's the, the human point again is the, the red dot in both of these images. Um, you can see humans are having a lot of trouble with uh, the low contrast images. Uh, but we can see the networks are doing really well when it comes to low contrast. Um, maybe uh, these convolutional neural networks should be put into a car that's driving late at night because they're able to uh, recognize uh, objects even in low contrast situations. However, if the contrast is increased, uh, remarkably the performance is not as good as humans. It seems like um, uh, at points uh, much sooner than the negative contrast, in the positive contrast setting, the performance is dropping. And that's not what we want to see. Uh, so if we were going to try to correct these algorithms, we would focus on high contrast uh, performance uh, because we kind of like what's happening in the low contrast setting. Okay, so that's objects. What else can we do? Again, if we're thinking about pedestrians in the case of perceptive automata, we probably want to deal with faces. Um, so it turns out that um, uh, face analysis and face recognition are very interesting when viewed under the lens of psychophysics. Um, so again, this is joint work between perceptive automata and my laboratory. Um, my lab, Brandon, again, uh, and then uh, Ali Kwan, uh, who was a student in my lab and now works at the company, um, and Sam Anthony, our uh, resident psychophysics expert. Um, this is a paper that's going to be presented at uh, ECCV uh, in September. Um, so face recognition is a specific case of object recognition. Um, and it's not quite the same thing uh, as object recognition, or at least in computer vision, it hasn't been treated the same. Um, so when we started this work, we, we kind of wanted to do the same types of experiments we were doing with objects, but in a face recognition context. Uh, but we had to adjust our procedure um, a little bit. So instead of finding a preferred view like we did before, we were just running these images through the networks and trying to figure out, you know, is there a good score or not? Uh, we need to find what are known as sheep in a biometrics context. What does that mean? That seems kind of strange. Um, why am I calling people sheep? Uh, well, it turns out that in the human biometrics literature, um, there's some interesting theory. Um, and this theory uh, uh, relates to um, a phenomenon uh, that uh, was observed by uh, Doddington. And he, he was studying recognition performance and recognition scores and trying to understand um, why some people uh, had no trouble using a biometric system and why other people had a lot of problems using a biometric system. Um, and it turned out, th for a number of reasons, um, uh, some people have trouble authenticating to biometrics. You know, if, if it's fingerprints, maybe they don't have fingerprints, or you know, they have a, a job that involves manual labor, so their fingerprints have rubbed off. This is something we saw a lot at SecureX when we were doing uh, user demos, user tests. Um, it turns out there's a lot of variation in human skin. Um, and so that might make somebody a goat, right? They have trouble um, uh, authenticating. Uh, the false reject rate of the system is high for those people. Um, there are also people called lambs who can be impersonated. Now it gets a little bit more serious in a security context um, because, right, um, don't want to be somebody who's easily impersonated because you want to make sure that uh, imposters are not trying to become you, right, because they could steal your money if they can log into your bank account or something. Uh, using the biometric authentication system. Uh, wolves, these are another class of people that are dangerous. Um, they are very good at impersonating other people. Um, so right, that means the false accept rate for the system um, is in their favor. Um, they can find these lambs and impersonate them. And then you have these really well-behaved people. This is like the system is working correctly. These are the sheep. Um, uh, they are not easily impersonated, and they don't easily impersonate other people. Um, and so the idea with this uh, work was, um, can we create an optimization that will search through a database of faces, try to pull out the well-behaving users, the sheep, uh, and that's where we're going to start when we start perturbing our images for the psychophysics experiment. Um, and so we can, again, choose um, a battery of different models. We can start changing uh, some condition. And then we'll see how the performance differs. And then we can try to falsify claims related to uh, human or superhuman uh, level performance when it comes to face recognition. And then ideally, this would help us improve uh, the security of, of face recognition in general. Um, and so we did this. And we looked at a number of, of different um, uh, conditions, very different from object recognition. Um, uh, so when it comes to procedurally rendered graphics, faces are great. These are all sorts of rendering engines you can obtain and start manipulating facial experience, uh, um, uh, appearance with. Uh, so for instance, you can change um, uh, uh, the expression. You know, maybe I want to simulate fear, but I want to do it in a fine-grained manner. 
how does that type of uh, expression change affect the recognition performance? Um, ideally, these again, we're looking at some convolutional neural networks here. We would expect the deep learning to be invariant uh, in some way, uh, but in many cases it's not. Um, simple expression change breaks it. Um, same thing with um, smiling, right? Very basic transformation of the 3D appearance of the face. Um, we can see drastically different behavior uh, on these curves. Um, so what did we look at in terms of recognition algorithms here? Uh, we looked at VGG face, um, which um, is, is more or less, I think, the, the tool of choice for most labs these days doing some kind of facial analysis work for feature extraction. Um, we also looked at um, two different implementations of Google's FaceNet algorithm, uh, here labeled FaceNet and OpenFace. Um, and, and I'll have a few more words to say about that in a second. Um, we also um, looked at OpenVR, which is a non-deep learning based system, so just old handcrafted features, LBP-like features. Uh, and then we looked at a very strange neural network um, that was three layers deep, but not trained with backpropagation. It was randomly screened, so just try to set the weights to be random, see if it gets good performance on a task, which was the labeled faces in the wild data set. Um, and if it was good, no problem. Um, and our results were quite surprising. So if you can see here, like the results for these 3D faces, um, that SLM simple algorithm, the three la layer convolutional neural network that was not really trained in any meaningful capacity, um, it seems to be strongly invariant to expression. Um, whereas uh, even VGG, which is trained on an incredible amount of face data, um, is starting to fail uh, uh, where the other algorithm is not even impacted at all. Um, so that was kind of an incredible finding from our perspective. Uh, we were also surprised to see that these two implementations of the same exact algorithm were wildly divergent in behavior, uh, which indicated to us that they were not the same thing at all. And when we dug into the code, it turns out that they were completely different, even though the authors had claimed that they were the same, uh, both based off of Google's paper. Google, unfortunately, never released a reference implementation of their face recognition algorithm. Uh, so other people on the internet were out there trying to replicate the results. Um, also surprising to us in all these cases, so th they're 2D over here, or sorry, 2D over there, 3D over here. Um, you can see human performance, again, plotted uh, in red. Here we have some, some more performance points. We actually have a full curve for all four of these uh, plots. We can see that the human performance isn't that great. Um, it seems like humans are highly impacted uh, when it comes to these conditions in certain cases. Um, and there's at least one model in all cases which is superior to the human level performance. Um, so it, when it comes to face recognition, uh, those claims of superhuman performance are not overblown. Uh, for at least these conditions, they seem to be true, uh, which is quite fascinating. Again, w when it comes to contrast, we saw similar uh, uh, effects as we saw um, with uh, the object recognition experiments, um, the human level performance was dropping before the model performance, except for the highly degenerate FaceNet model, which is one of these Google re-implementations that was just not good in general. Okay, so almost done here. A few parting thoughts for autonomous vehicles. Um, how are we incorporating this information back at Perceptive Automata? Um, there, number one, is a large disparity between data set performance and real world performance. Um, so think self-driving cars in 2018. We don't have them yet, despite all of the hype, all of the excitement, and some really good legitimate uh, technological breakthroughs. They're still not safe enough and they're still not reliable enough to use on roads anywhere. Um, visual psychophysics is a primary tool used to study vision in psychology and neuroscience. Why aren't we using it in computer vision? Um, that is a very good question. So I'm out here as an evangelist telling all of you, if you're doing computer vision work, to think about this. Uh, but don't give up your data sets. They're still important. They still give us information to use uh, for training and evaluation. So you may want to think about combining data sets with psychophysics-based evaluation, which is what we're doing at the company, um, and how we are keeping ourselves honest when we make claims about human-level performance. All right, with that, I'll take any questions you may have. Surely there's a question. Could be about startups, it could be about technology, research. Yeah. A uh, more practical question about uh, when you start to work with students, um, there's something good that go out from the relationship. How is the trans transpiration from that from university to your to, to, to a company, like, yeah, how do you make that transition? That's a great, that's a fantastic question. Um, because, yeah, th the answer, I think, depends on the situation. Um, and I, it, it's, you know, what, what 
what is the commercialization path, number one? Um, what experience does the student have, number two? I think most students in computer science don't really have business training at all in most cases. <laughs> Unless you've gone through Terry Volt's Bachelor of Innovation program, then you've got it covered, but most people have not done that. Um, so I think, I, I think um, th there's a process. Um, We've done this in the past. It's kind of easing somebody into uh, uh, the company. So it's like they may understand how to do the research. They may understand the, you know, the programming, software development, uh, how to run experiments, how to collect data, how to analyze data. They, they've got all those bases covered, but they don't really know well, how do you build a product from that, right? You've got all the pieces, but you don't have the thing you can sell. Uh, and number two, how do you get the skills to right, transition this to, to the marketplace? Um, so it really is putting that student in touch with people that do have those skills. So I think that's where like, it's not just about one person starting a company, it's about a team forming. Uh, and that team has to have some diverse skills and then people learning from each other. And then right, you're sort of ready to start building the product and starting to, to start selling the product. Um, I don't think there's anything like a book or like a video or like course will tell you that you know, will help you. You have to just do it. Um, a, a lot of uh, the training right, we give students in terms of entrepreneurship and, and forming companies is very hands-on, very practical. Um, uh, you know, it's like pair, pair the student with an existing company um, so they can get those skills or sort of work with them and form this team, this heterogeneous team, so they can gain those skills. Um, that's kind of how, in my opinion, it should be done. And that's how I, I've seen it happen twice at least and it worked out. Very good question. I was like, oh, where did, the, oh, where did that come from? Yes. Um, so w when I was doing my postdoc, um, I was uh, in a neuroscience group, <laughs> which is an interesting pivot in and of itself. Um, so, so while I was at Securix and working on um, a lot of these technologies, I realized uh, quickly that they were not as good as, as natural vision, right, biological vision. Um, and so I wanted to understand why that was the case. We had fast computers, we had a lot of data, we had algorithms that seemed to be good, but there was still something missing. Um, so um, I would go to conferences and talk to various people and I would sometimes run into some folks um, from the Roland Institute at Harvard who were um, neuroscientists, they were biologists, but they were working on computer vision. Um, and they had all sorts of interesting insights into why this was the case, what were we missing. Um, and so um, eventually I, I went to work with them um, when I was doing my postdoc and um, started to learn about things like psychophysics. Uh, uh, and, and that was one of the first projects I jumped into, uh, working with Ken Nakayama, who at the time was the chair of Harvard's psych department, who is a very, very influential uh, psychophysics person uh, who was studying facial perception. Uh, specifically, he was studying uh, prosopagnosia, um, this uh, deficit that some people have. They can't recognize faces, a complete inability to recognize faces. Uh, so the lab was studying that, and they were also studying um, uh, super recognizers, people with an extraordinary ability to uh, recognize faces. So it was a good project for me to jump into because I had a strong background in face recognition um, and I wanted to learn more about the, the sort of psychological aspects of this uh, so I can make my systems better. And so I, I spent years uh, hanging out in Ken's lab learning about this and then working with his student who was Sam Anthony who was the co-founder of the company as you saw in the video. <laughs> so small, small world uh, but it all kind of came together. And we realized, um, we had grander hopes, um, we still have grand hopes that uh, more fundamental neuroscience will make this even better. So a big thrust in my lab has been um, to reverse engineer um, uh, biological neural networks. So trying to do microscopy experiments to understand how uh, the brain is wiring itself together and how it functions um, and then try to build artificial neural networks that more resemble that structure and function. Um, but during my postdoc I realized very quickly this is going to take forever um, and the behavioral work we were doing on the psychophysics side was leading to uh, results more quickly and, and we were getting more useful stuff uh, in the short term out of that. Uh, and so that was kind of the trajectory that led us to all of this work which I just presented. We haven't given up hope that the more fundamental neuroscience will yield huge breakthroughs, <laughs> but we're still working on that. Um, that's a whole other series of lectures I can give one day. <laughs> but yeah, it's, it's a great question, but that's kind of how it unfolded. In the startup line, how do you build a good team and, and keep it running on the, on the long term? Because you said like you have these super geniuses that went to Harvard to <laughs> out to everyone. But, but in the real world, in a startup, there are super interesting things to do, but some really boring stuff to, 
to do also to trade the, to, to trade with customers to do and support to many, many yes people. yeah 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 and, and on the other hand how do you prevent them from splitting up yeah, so, so this is important. Um, like everybody can't work on what some people perceive to be the fun stuff, right? <laughs> um, that's what I think everybody can have fun doing what they feel passionate about. Um, so when we build teams, what we try to do is like f find a core group that, number one, works well together. That's probably the most important thing. Um, they don't have to be super geniuses. I, don't, I, don't, I wouldn't consider any of these people to be like mega super geniuses. I don't even know if that's a real thing, right? Um, th these are just like really well-motivated people. Sure, they're smart, but like I, I think they're just really passionate about what they do. Um, and that's key because, I mean, you're going to find some people that love research. They love trying to explore, you know, biological vision. How does that work? But you're also going to find people equally as passionate about things like business development, uh, about things like um, um, uh, project management. Right? And if you can find the right people that get along together, that uh, all like what they do, that's the kind of team you want to build. But that's easier said than done. Right? It may take a long time to find the right group. I think what's interesting, uh, starting a company from a university, um, you already have these groups formed in many cases. Right? You have lab groups. You have a bunch of people who know how to get along, hopefully, with each other. Or maybe not. But maybe you just find the people who work well together, and, and they form the company. Um, uh, it's, it's, you know, if you could take that sort of out of the university and put it into a corporate context, like you've already had the core of your team, and then it's a matter of, well, do they have friends? Probably. Do those friends do things that aren't exactly the same thing that they do? Probably. Um, maybe, right, you can find people with business skill that way, other engineering skill. Um, right, you still need software developers, um, even if you're a research-oriented company. That's a different skill set than doing computer vision work. Um, but, but again, if you know people, uh, people that you may want to work with that have those skills, try to convince them to join. Um, and that's kind of how you do it. Uh, recruiting is really tough. I mean, you could also do a traditional job search, which is kind of where Perceptive Automata is at now. Right? We have open positions. We interview lots of candidates. Um, but it's an arduous process. If we can find people that we've worked with in the past before that we know we can do stuff with, um, and again, not everybody is the same, then that's the ideal situation. And how do you prevent them from going to other companies because I believe working in Automata must be very fun, but when Google or Amazon come and say, yeah. Yeah, so um, yeah, so that's a good question. Um, I think there's some, there are some issues. I think um, if you can keep the work environment positive and interesting, people will stay. Especially, again, if, if you have a group that formed at a university lab and they've been working together for years, they may want to keep working together. Um, so there may not be as large of a risk that people will flee. Um, but then again, I, I, told, I told you a story about you know, a company that kind of broke apart as people like, left for you know, Amazon and Google and other places like that. Um, I mean, I think there are people who are purely motivated by money. Um, if that's the case, like, you may question them as an employee in general if they're just bouncing from company to company chasing a paycheck. Uh, I think, again, like, obviously like, we all need to work and make money. Uh, and the point of a startup is to build value. But the point isn't to just maximize your personal um, uh, wealth. I mean, if you wanted to do that, you shouldn't do a startup. You should just go to finance, right? Work for a hedge fund or something. Uh, go to uh, New York, London, right? Don't don't do a startup. I mean, there could be a big exit, but but typically the, it's not going to be as much money over the long term as like a career in finance, a successful career in finance. So just yeah, just do that. Um, so so I think you should just be aware. Like some people will. I mean, you can look at especially um, employment histories and figure out. It's like does this person bounce around a lot? And then you can also see what companies they worked at, and you can probably infer that. Uh, this person is chasing a, a paycheck and isn't really committed to the project that you have you know, to, to offer. Um, uh, but again, like, I think that, that risk will always be there. Um, surprisingly, no one left Securix and no one has left Perceptive Automata like, chasing a big paycheck. Um, the Perce uh, Perceptive, um, yeah, we, we just haven't seen that. And at, at, um, at Securix, people left because the company was like, in this funny state where it was transitioning, uh, uh, as the story told you. So. Um, but, but I know this is very common. It does, it does happen, and it is a concern. Water? Yes? How is the politics in the U.S. universities with faculty that are doing startups? Ah, uh, yeah. So that, that is, that's a great question. Um, and, and most, in most cases, in my experience, um, the experience has been positive. Universities are very keen to have impact beyond just scholarly publication. Um, and they're also trying to make money. 
in the US, so this is another, I'm not sure if this is the case here, but in the US, like all universities see computer science, uh, technologies, and intellectual property as a huge cash cow, potential cash cow. Um, a lot of universities have made a bit of money um, uh, with, with patents and licensing IP and spin out companies uh, in, in um, uh, biomedical technologies, pharmaceutical technologies, therapeutics, uh, but not really in computer science yet. Um, but everybody sees companies like you know, Facebook, which did technically spin out of Harvard, but Harvard didn't get any money out of that. And they're very upset about that to this day. Um, but, but they see the potential for other Facebooks coming out of the university, um, and they'd like to get a piece of that. So what universities are doing now is um, providing support for companies. Um, if you're faculty, if you're a student, you know, they'll give you space. Uh, they may even give you money. Um, uh, uh, Securix, uh, for instance, um, uh, uh, the University of Colorado owned all of the IP uh, and also put in uh, some amount of money in the beginning to get it off the ground. Um, uh, and so that was helpful. So it's almost like they're your seed investor. Uh, but the danger is, um, especially with the university, they own all of the intellectual property. Um, so anything you do at the university is owned by the university. So if you file patents, the university owns the patents. Um, so when Securix uh, sold, quote unquote, um, what happened was that big biometrics company paid the University of Colorado um, a lot of money to buy out the IP portfolio. Um, so they, they, they transferred the patents to their company, the university made its money and was thrilled, right? Because that's exactly what they wanted to have happen. Uh, the danger for the entrepreneur is that um, you may give up too much of your company early by having the university come in and promise you all these things. And, and in some cases, they'll take a pretty big equity stake. Um, so, so you have to be wary. Um, but but again, for, for now, I think it's still, I think it's still decent. It's like a net gain if you can be smart about negotiating with the university. And you can always negotiate. They don't say, like, here are the rules. We can't do anything else. Um, you can always negotiate with them. At Notre Dame, um, we've opened up a facility, an innovation center, where there's space for startups. Uh, the university, again, will kind of incentivize uh, professors uh, to, to generate IP. Um, they have IP lawyers. They have the whole setup. Um, so it looks kind of slick. Um, and for our area, too, I think it's really important. Um, uh, South Bend, Indiana is, is kind of an old industrial town. It's not the most economically prosperous place, even though we have a world-class, excellent university there. Um, the rest of the economy that isn't tied to the university is kind of you know, down in the dumps. Um, and so the university feels it can play a good civic role. Um, uh, like you, we're a Catholic school, right? So it's like helping uh, the situation uh, with respect to poverty in the local area, um, you know, that could be addressed with startups and other things. Really stimulate the economy, uh, get more people to move to the area, form companies, grow those companies. Those companies are gonna pay people, they're gonna put more money into the local economy. Um, that's what Notre Dame is thinking. So I think that's kind of exciting too. Okay, so, so for question number one, that one doesn't bother me usually too much. Um, I think AI startups, compared to other types of startups, like compared to like, um, like a biotech company, it's extremely cheap. I mean, you're basically, you just need computers and people, and that's basically it. Sure, you have to collect a lot of data, um, but that may be more time consuming than it is expensive, I guess. But then, then again, your time is money. Um, and the internet is such a great repository of data um, that you can be smart and try to leverage as much open access data as possible. And that's what we do at the university, and it's what we've done at every company I've been involved with. Um, and it's never been too much of a problem. Um, that said, like, you will have to do some physical data collections at some point. Um, and, and that can be kind of time consuming and expensive, but still in the grand scheme of things, like, it's nothing like a biotech startup. Um, so I wouldn't worry too much about that. Um, the second question, yeah, where do you get your money? Where does the funding come from? So one thing I didn't talk too much about um, in this talk was funding. I have another version of this talk, which is a little bit more US-centric, which is why I cut some of that out. Um, so Securix had an interesting path uh, uh, in terms of funding. 
Um, in the US, the federal government um, has uh, specific funding mechanisms for small businesses, which are phenomenal. So instead of going out and raising money from, say, VCs or angel investors, um, where you're giving up a big equity stake early on in your company, you can apply for these special grants from the US government. Um, and um, through these grants, you will get basically see, on, on the level of seed capital, so, you know, it's like maybe at best, you know, a few million dollars, which is pretty good, right? And there's no strings attached other than you have to meet the government requirements for whatever um, uh, contract you sign with them. And it's usually not too arduous, especially if your uh, money is coming from something like the National Science Foundation in the U.S. Um, their requirements are give us um, regular status reports and write us a final report. Um, and then uh, we will be satisfied. So that's not a terrible arrangement. Uh, when they come and give you a bunch of money, uh, want nothing uh, in terms of uh, equity in your company. Um, and, and so that's how we started Securix. Um, it, uh, we also um, did one of these uh, grants uh, to start Perceptive Automata. Um, so that was great. It gave us a, a nice uh, runway before we had to turn to investors. Um, investors are convenient, though. It's, there are a lot of people out there with a lot of money. Um, but of course, they want to maximize um, their return in the end, right? So there's a lot of negotiation. Uh, which can be sort of nerve-wracking, especially if you've never dealt with that before. Um, uh, but again, we, we completely avoided that with Securix. It's like we went right from that government funding to real revenue coming in to the company. Um, and, and so that, that's always a good thing. Uh, there are other ways to fund a company too, especially if you're a student. So, some of them are risky, some of them are not. Um, you could simply like find friends who have money and like bring them into the company. I've seen people use credit cards, which I don't recommend. That's extremely risky. Uh, but in America, you can, get, you can get a lot of credit cards for <laughs> not much effort. And that, that will give you like many thousands of dollars in some cases, <laughs> which could keep you going for a little bit anyway. Um, but eventually, you have to pay that money back, which is bad. Um, <laughs> uh, so, so there are some, some alternatives. Um, I, I mentioned uh, as the question that just came up before, like what, what are universities doing to support startups? Um, in the US, you can often get um, seed money at fairly decent terms from the university. Um, and that'll jumpstart you. And the university will fix you up with space. Um, the university space is nice, too, because you're not really paying rent or like met rent at market uh, rates, usually. Um, you have access to the university internet, which would be great if you're, you're doing research, because you can get access to like the IEEE library, the Springer library. You'll have all of these resources that you know, startups that don't have any attachment to an academic institution uh, have. Um, so there are huge advantages there. Um, a lot of universities, too, in the US, well, they'll fix you up with lawyers, so like uh, IP lawyers, uh, lawyers to help you start your company. Um, they'll often just pay for that outright because they have you know, a big incentive to get companies launched out of the university. Um, so for academics in the US, it's really good. Again, I'm not sure what happens here, if it's the same, same thing. More or less the same. Yeah, so that's pretty good. I think, I think a lot of countries are jumping in on this because I think every university feels they could cash in on the next Facebook, which <laughs> it's just not going to happen. But <laughs> <laughs> they, they keep thinking it, and it, and it sort of helps us, so it's, I guess it's okay. Other questions? Yeah? How do you know a piece of research or uh, investigation or research is like would uh, work to pursue and get a good start? Ooh, that's a good one. So how do you know you have a good idea that will make money? It's not just you know, a nice piece of theory, a nice, a nice academic result. Um, I think this is where you have to think more broadly as an academic. So you know, you, you can't just say like, no, this will excite people at the conference. You know, you have to think, will this excite somebody uh, and make them pay money for for whatever this is? Um, and you have to do some market research. Um, so this is something in computer scientists typically don't do market analysis studies of any sort. Um, this is more of a business school skill, um, but it's a good one to have. You can. You know, keep up with the news. Uh, read, right, like uh, the business section of the newspaper. Uh, try to see what people are interested in, uh, what problems exist in certain industries. And if all of a sudden you make the connection, hey, this algorithm I just created would be perfect to solve this problem in this industry uh, because I just read about this problem in The Economist last week. All right? And it's like now all of a sudden, like the creative juices are flowing. You realize um, there could be some impact. So then what you would do is look for other companies doing similar things, look for other academics doing similar things, because they may be thinking about uh, forming a company as well. Um, you know, see if there's any competition. If there's not, that might be great. Um, if there isn't, you may still be suspicious, because maybe um, this is not a viable uh, path right, to commercialize something. Um, you have to figure out, you know, have people tried to do this and failed in the past? So you'll do more research. 
Um, and you really just want to own that space, right? To understand everything about that particular industry and that particular need. And then if you've checked everything and things seem to check out, you should probably talk to somebody who knows something about business and see if they agree with you. Um, and then maybe you're onto something in terms of commercialization. Um, so it just requires some research, I'd say. A different type of research, though, than CS research. Okay, let's thank the speaker. <laughs> Great, thanks everybody. So we see you tomorrow at 9 in case you are coming to the tutorial.